So Phil, I'm not sure you've got a fantastic name there, Fitzgerald. I'm just wondering in a minute if you're linked to Ireland, perhaps you are, but let me just introduce you. Now we've this, we've got this up on the website if you want to have a look at it later. So Phil, you're the director of the Financial Reporting Lab. I think nearly everyone in the room will have heard of that. And this is a group which operates or engages with a wide range of stakeholders, including companies, investors, and academia to research hot topics in corporate reporting. And you've engaged in a number of recent publications, including reporting on risks, uncertainties and opportunities, virtual and augmented reality in corporate reporting, and reporting on corp climate related disclosures. You're currently, and maybe it'll be good for you to tell us a little bit about this, Philip. Uh, sorry, Phil, you are currently involved on a range of projects, including cyber digital, data risk and sustainability reporting. And prior to joining the FRC, you worked in audit practice and you are an ICAEW. So you're in good company today, uh, Phil. The room is full of accountants. I think mostly everyone in the room is an accountant. So you're going to provide a unique insight into current important themes in the accounting profession, which can help universities to consider any new developments that might help shape our curriculum. So, Phil, we've allocated about for an hour for your discussion, but if you would like to maybe do your presentation first, um, and I would encourage everybody as well you, you, to engage in the chat function. Everybody hopefully knows where that is, yeah. And as Phil is talking, if there's a question or a query or just even a response that you have in relation to what he said, if you would please put that into the chat function, um, that would be greatly appreciated because otherwise one forgets what one is thinking at the time. So Phil, if you wanna go ahead now and do your presentation and then we will have a question and answer session, uh, that would be great. Thank you, Phil. Thank you so much, Joan, and uh, I'm, I'm, I feel really honoured to to be invited along along to talk talk today because I think, you know, it, it's such an it's such an exciting time in the in the accountancy profession at, at the moment. There are so many things changing and so many great opportunities for for accountants as we as we move move the agenda forward. Um, and I'm, I'm just really thrilled to, to have this opportunity to, to talk to you guys and be given a whole hour to, uh, to, to, to do that. Um, I, I'm very much looking forward to, to the questions coming through um, uh, when, when they do and, and making this as, as interactive as, as possible. Um, I, Joan, I'm very ashamed to say that even though I've got a, a, an Irish looking name, I've got no idea about my, my heritage. I, certainly my grandparents weren't, weren't Irish, but I've never, I've never sought to sort of look into going back further than that. But there must be something, mustn't there, with, with a name like that. But may, maybe after this, you'll inspire me to actually look it, look it up um, <laughs> going forward. So I'm sorry about that, uh, but, but there we go. Um, I, it, it's really interesting kind of um, preparing for this uh, for this presentation. I was sort of looking back over, um, I've been in the accountancy profession for, for 25 years now, currently working at the Financial Reporting Council um, and uh, dire as director of the Financial Reporting Lab, which I'll talk about in, in a moment. But I thought I'd sort of do a bit of a look back over my career because I think, it, I think the way that's kind of evolved Sort of points towards kind of how the how the profession has changed and how it might might continue uh, changing. So I started off as a as an auditor in at KPMG um, in in the audit practice, and I remember when I when I started, um, you know, the the focus, the methodology that um, most audit firms uh, adopted at, at that time, and certainly at, at KPMG, was that when you went out and did an audit. Um, you you very much took a, a balance sheet approach to to the audit. So, you know, you, you you'd look at the balance sheet and you'd say, okay, fixed assets. Let's start there. Um, okay, they've got some fixed assets. They've got some buildings. I can see that. They've got some computers. Maybe at that time, uh, I can see those. I can I can do a stock. I can look at invoices. I can I can check that off. You do fixed assets. You go on to current assets. You look at uh, debtors. You know, in the days that debtors were called debtors rather than receivables, as they are of course now. Um, and you you check you know has, has the money come in since the year end um, you know are these were these genuine debtors at the at the balance sheet date and so so on and so forth and of course you know when I first started as an auditor 
uh, the juniors were always given the stock section. Why were they given the stock section? Because stock takes were always done on New Year's Eve. Who 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 were the mugs who were willing to go out and do a stock take on New Year's Eve? It was uh, you know it was the it was the juniors. So 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 you went off and you ticked off all the all the stock items and so and and so forth. And and really that that was that was very much the the approach and the methodology uh, shared I think by many by many accounting firms at the time. Then of course you know Enron, uh, WorldCom happened, and it, you know that that balance sheet approach was starting to get a little bit out of out of date. Of course many of the problems at Enron were not rela were not related to items on the balance sheet; they were off balance sheet. And, and what I think, what I think, firms realised at that time was actually there needed to be accountants needed to be much more tuned in to how the business was operating, what its business model was, what its what its strategy and approach was, you know, how how it was how it was managing its business, and therefore how that would impact on on the financial statements and what, what was in the financial statements. So I remember at the time, I think we called it Audit 2000 back at um, back back in the day. Crikey, was it really 22 years since the millennium? Oh my goodness. Um, but, you know, KPMG came up with this with this new approach um, that very much focused on getting, getting an understanding of the business first and then thinking about, well, you know, having understood the business, having understood how it works, you know, what's the impact on, on the financial statements. Then, of course, a little bit later um, in, in and, and we're, we're move, moving forward really in the in the US response to uh, to, to the problems at Enron and, and, and Wellcom, the introduction of, of Sarbanes-Oxley. And actually, at that point, I moved from uh, practicing audit from doing audits to moving to the professional practice department at, at KPMG, which was responsible for the the audit methodology and um, and the um, uh, and, and the rolling out kind of training to to the audit practice. And, and Sarbanes Oxley was a big part of that because a, a lot of a lot of KPMG's clients at that time uh, were foreign private issuers. They were listed in the US and and the UK, so there needed to be this this focus on um, not just the actual numbers in the financial statements, but the processes, the controls in place, um, in, in in order to ensure that those that, uh, that the financial statements were accurate. So, it, it very much sort of evolved into, or my role very much evolved into more training around kind of getting that understanding of, of processes and controls. And of course, at this time, you know, things were becoming much more automated. Um, you know, the actual numbers it themselves were, were being generated by accounting systems. So there was a much greater need to understand how those accounting systems were generating those numbers rather than, the, than ticking off the numbers um, them, themselves. Um, I then, uh, after 10 very good years at, at, at KPMG, I decided I'd, I'd go off on my own and I started a, a training company which ran training courses on IFRS, which was uh, being implemented in the UK at that time. This is, this is 2005 now. And Sarbanes-Oxley, which was coming into the UK. So there was a lot of demand out there for, uh, for people to, to, to train businesses on on, on getting up to speed with with these and implementing the these new requirements so I did that for for, for five years and and actually the focus very much went from initially um, a, a big demand for IFRS training either the, the accounting rules to much more helping companies with their systems processes and controls over generating that and in line with kind of sarbanes oxley and and, and, and other 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 uh, things. Um, and then 12 years ago, I joined the, the FRC. Um, the FRC, I started in the uh, audit inspection unit, as it was then called. So that's the unit that um, goes out and inspects the audits of uh, the big four and other, uh, and other large accounting uh, audit firms, sorry. Um, did that for five years and then I moved into, uh, into enforcement, actually, um, and looked at some of the uh, most interesting uh, corporate failures, um, and to, to to identify whether there were areas that that uh, you know the audit firms could could improve on those, and to to see where we might take take enforcement action. And then five years ago, I moved into the financial reporting lab, which is actually the completely opposite end of the spectrum in terms of a regulatory approach uh, to enforcement. The lab is very much a collaborative space for companies and investors to come together to explore better ways of, of, of reporting. Um, I wanted to say a bit about um, 
th how the FRC has evolved as well, because as well as sort of seeing how my career has, has evolved in accounting, I think it's interesting to see how the how the regulator has has developed. So, I mean, the, the FRC in the early days very much focused on, you know, the FRC is the regulator for the accountancy and actuarial and audit professions, as, as you know. But in the early days, it was very much focused on, on accounting. It included the accounting standard setter in the UK that set, set uh, UK accounting standards. Um, and then it also incorporated what we now call the corporate reporting review team, which is the team that goes out and takes the sample of, uh, of, of financial statements from, uh, from listed companies and, and performs a review and writes to those companies if they think that anything is not um, in compliance with the, with the accounting standards. That was very much the sort of genesis of, of the FRC. But over time, it started to expand its remit into other areas. As well as accounting, it brought in the, the audit side, so the audit standard setter, and also the um, audit review team. So both you know, the, the team that set the standards, but then also the team that reviewed compliance against those standards. So that very much mirrored um, the accounting side where we both had the standard setter and then the, uh, the, the monitoring team. But over time, it expanded its remit to look at actuaries. So we've, we're responsible for actuarial oversight. Um, we were then uh, tasked with the with the job of uh, of coming up with the corporate governance code. So it's sort of moving away from the financial statements and the focus of uh, uh, on audit of, of those financial statements. Uh, we also author the stewardship code. So that's a code for uh, for investors. So how they can um, demonstrate their steward they're taking their stewardship responsibilities seriously. We recently updated that to ensure that. Um, investor, investors were taking into account ESG considerations in their environmental, social, and governance considerations in their uh, in their investment decisions and reporting on that. Um, we were then given the task of um, uh, of coming up with this strategic report guidelines. So the strategic report regulations were brought in, I think, back in uh, 2016, and the FRC was given the role of uh, you know authoring the strategic report guidelines. So I think you can see that as well as, you know, observations from, from my sort of 25 years in accounting, actually that the regulator also has moved away from purely a focus on financial statement information to other areas which end up in different parts of the, the annual report. So corporate governance, the strategic report, and then for, for investors, you know, how they should do their how, how they should do their stewardship. And actually, even if you look at, at what used to be um, the team that focused on reviewing financial statements, if you look at their recent work, so this is our corporate reporting review team at the FRC, the focus, the focus is always going to be on compliance with, with IFRS and, you know, are the, are the financial statements um, following that. But actually, if you look increasingly, they're looking at other areas of, of reporting in, in the annual report. Um, they're most recently, they did a study on how companies are reporting on climate change and how, you know, climate change is reported on in the front half of the annual report, but also, you know, how climate change risk impacts the financial statements. So going back to, to my thoughts about, you know, it used to be you take a balance sheet and tick off the items as, as an auditor. Actually, it's much, you know, the, the audit profession and, and the profession generally is much more about these sort of more sort of macro um, uh, risk areas and how that might impact on on reporting and, and getting an understanding of that is is really important so you know corporate our corporate reporting and review team is doing another thematic on the implementation of uh, TCFD reporting which is the task force for climate related financial disclosures reporting again that's kind of you know going wider than than just focusing on 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 the financial statements and I think you know, if we look at how how the FRC has evolved, um, you know, perhaps the focus of the regulator gives us some insight into into the future of of, of the profession. And I, you know, I, I look back to you know what are, what are accountants really good at? You know, what, what where are accountants really really valued? And at at, at a very sort of basic level, I guess, you know, when you go back to your, your initial accountancy training, it's a long time since I've done it, but I know we were taught, you know, 
you, you had a box of receipts and, and you had a couple of bank statements and you, you had to kind of pull all those disparate bits of data together to produce information that was meaningful for for decision making you know you you take all these sort of bits of bits of data if you like and and you turn them into um, a, a profit and loss account and a balance sheet and that profit and loss and balance sheet can be used for you know decision making for for companies to decide where they want to invest you know how much money they've got in reserves how, how much scope they've got you know for, for tax authorities to to identify how much tax they should should be paying you know, for, for investors to, to make capital allocation decisions based on, on, on that information. And so I always think of, of you know, the, the real skill of, of accountants is, is, is turning that, the, the, those, those bits of data into something meaningful for, for decision makers to make. And I think when I look at what's, what's changing is, it, is two things. I, I think the first thing is that, you know, much, much of that sort of manual, um, process of taking a box of receipts and turning it into a into a something meaningful much of that is now completely automated um, you know there are there are so many accounting tools out there um, that, that we're all familiar with that, that really is automating a lot of that kind of manual uh, processing and 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 really kind of chucking out a PL and a balance sheet without you really having to, to to do very much as an accountant now that might sound a bit bit depressing and uh you know I'd, I'd hate to to give the impression that a load of accountants are going to become redundant as, as a result because i think what 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 how they how accountants have, have evolved is that whilst that's not as big a part of the role as it used to be i think what's much and what's a much bigger part of, of the role now is interpreting that and and really understanding you know how these accounting systems are processing processing the data to give assurance that when you know when a, when an accounting system pops out a, a profit and loss account and balance sheet that you, you've got assurance that actually you know it's got the right information it's captured the right right results and also what's missing from that profit and loss and balance sheet what's off balance sheet you know what what hasn't the accounting system processed what what are the other things that the business is doing you know which will will impact the financial statements but isn't necessarily kind of based on the box of receipts that you might have might might have used used to have so a real kind of understanding of of, of processes systems and controls is 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 almost becoming much more important than the actual understanding of, of the basic accounting it, itself having said that and i'm sure we'll come on to 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 some questions and, and debate about this you know whenever i whenever i sort of have an accounting issue and and i used to use this when i was um, in the enforcement team in, at the frc you know how, how did they get that number which appears to not be the right number you know the first thing i always do is what's the double entry for that because actually that you know understanding the double entry and, and how that transaction actually came to came to end up in that balance which i now think might be wrong you know really understanding the basics of accounting is it, still really important um, but but I think it's much there's much more focus now on really understanding processes, systems, and controls ar around it. So I think that's that's the first thing I, I see that you know it, it, it is changing in in the profession. The second thing that's changing in in the profession and and really accelerating at the moment is that it's not just financial data that accountants are are, are dealing with at at the moment. And you know one of one of the strengths of um, one of the strengths of the accountants, as I said, is turning data into information for, for decision making. And, you know, when I look at companies now, the, the, the growth in data that companies hold, but also the data that is held on companies is exponentially growing. You know, there's, I'm sure you'll be able to give me sort of much more um, academic evidence behind this. Um, but, you know, that there's, there's information on you know, companies' carbon emissions. There's information on diversity. There's information on CEO pay ratios uh, on all sorts of all sorts of areas. And you know, when when we we in the lab start talking to to companies about how they're dealing with with all of these challenges, it used to be the case that you know the the finance department was very much the department that pulls together the financial statements and then another department would pull pull together the rest of the annual report 
now when we're talking to companies, those things are becoming much more integrated. So whilst, whilst accountants aren't going out there and measuring carbon emissions or, or trying to measure uh, diversity statistics and that sort of thing, what accountants are doing is taking that data and turning it into meaningful information. Going back to what I was saying earlier, turning it into to information that can be used for decision making at the company um, you know, and but also by those who are providing capital into into that company, and so I so I think that's I think that's the other real challenge for accountants, but also a fantastic opportunity because companies are turning to their accountants to 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 to, to process this information because they know the accountants are used to turning data into information for. For, for decision making and, and therefore they, those processes are, are very much we're turning to, to the accountants. Um, I'm sure we'll talk talk more Joan I know you've got some questions and I can see some questions already coming through the chat about you know kind of how that's evolving and and, and therefore what that might mean for for you as as, uh, as teaching the the future generation of uh, of accountants coming coming through. But th those are the two things that I, I very much wanted to wanted to um, highlight as, as the things that I think there's real change in the in the profession, but also real real opportunity. And then finally, I just wanted to talk a bit about what the lab is. Um, as as you say, m many on the call will already know uh, how the lab lab works. As I, I said, the lab is is a is a collaborative space for companies and investors to come together. So we go out and talk to investors about you know, where they would like to see improvement in areas of reporting. And then we go and speak to companies about, you know, how they're tackling some of those challenges. And we kind of bring them all together into a room and, and try to identify good practices. And, and, you know, the reports that we produce are very practical guides to, you know, what does good climate reporting look like, for example, what does good risk reporting look like, et cetera, et cetera. The other aspect that we're, we're very much uh, fo focusing on in, in the lab is not, not just the, the content of reporting, so climate reporting, risk reporting, et cetera, but also how reporting is being delivered, you know, what technologies are now being used to, uh, to deliver reporting from corporates to to investors or from corporates to uh, to the owners of, of the business and increasingly that's 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 in a digital format so for hundreds of years we've had uh, we've, we've had annual reports produced in a paper format now for the first time in the UK public companies are required to report digitally and that's make, that's having a big impact on how that information is pulled together how it's used how it flows through the the investment system um, and we're focusing very much on that. So we've looked at technologies like XBRL, um, uh, artificial intelligence, um, as you said at the start, Joan, we've also looked at things like virtual reality and augmented reality, which believe it or not, increasingly is being used by corporates to communicate their financial information to, um, to, to investors. Um, and, and we've also looked at blockchain, which of course, you know, has the potential to provide greater kind of trust and transparency in the information being communicated so so those are those are those are a few of the areas that um uh that uh that the lab is focusing on on at the moment um we're looking at we've got a project at the moment which is uh specifically looking at esg data um and that that is initially looking at how so my sort of premise at the start is that companies accounting systems have, have very much developed um, o o over time. However, companies systems for processing and generating ESG data are, are much less mature that, you know, there's not a range of kind of accounting pack, uh, sorry, ESG package, packages, if you like, to process ESG data as there is for financial data. So we're looking at how companies are kind of tackling that challenge at the moment. There's so much demand from the investment community for better and more consistent ESG data, but companies got the challenge of, well, they haven't got a, you know, a, a, an, a, an equivalent accounting system to be able to process that data. So the first stage of this project on ESG data is to look at how companies are starting to automate their systems in relation to ESG. And then we're going to look at how that ESG data flows through the investment process. So the extent to which the, the credit rating agencies are, sorry, not credit rating agencies, the, the data aggregators are taking that data and using it to rate companies for their ESG credentials. 
and then all the way up to you know how investors are using that in in investment decision making all the way through to the um, asset owners and and the ultimate investor which is uh, hopefully all of us uh, investing in pension schemes and so forth um, I'm going to stop there uh, because I've probably covered quite a lot and I can see there's already questions. So happy to take questions. And uh, Joan, how, do you, how, how would you like to play this? <laughs> well, yes. Well, <clears throat> maybe if I could start off, Phil, thank you very mm. much. Um, I can maybe any, if anyone is on clear about what the FR Lab does, maybe just put it into the chat box. Uh, Phil, is that who, who, who? does the FR lab constitute you know what sort of people are working there are these futuristic people or are they all accountants for example um there's quite a few accountants um so uh within the lab there there is now a staff of, of of eight uh the majority are accountants but we also have um a company secretary um often because um you know, the company secretary has a, has a really key role in, in many businesses in kind of pulling the whole annual report to, together, but also, you, you know, obviously uh, dealing with what, what the board is discussing and, and, and that sort of thing. So um, we'd actually, you know, uh, whilst we've got the majority of accountants in there, and I think that that, that probably says a lot about how the, the future role of the, of the profession um, it would be good to bring in a greater range uh, of, of people in in the future, but you know that the the responsibility for for, um, for for much of the information in the annual report is increasingly for, falling to to the finance functions, or the finance functions are increasingly having a having a greater greater role in that. But does it, I hope does that, that before yes yeah. so, sorry Joan and before I, I hope at some point we we should probably talk about the International Sustainability Standards Board which has just been set mm -hmm. up but maybe if, if we don't get a chance to talk about that remind me towards the end because I think that's an important part of this uh, of this discussion as well. Okay. So um, sorry Phil are you saying then that I just want to get this clear that mm. the role of the accountant in preparing these reports is reducing and the finance people are taking more of a role is that what you're saying i think that no i think that think the finance people who are accountants are are playing an increasing role in um in, in pulling together the information that in, in the front half of the annual report um because because of this need to connect the information in the front half to the back half um it you know, it, in the past, the financial statements were very much the function of the finance department and the accountants, and the front half was often, you know, the responsibility of a sort of overall corporate team or the company secretary or, or some or something else. And you know, and then the two parts were kind of sewn together. I think increasingly, because there's a need to join them together, increasingly, mm -hmm. actually, you know, who's who might be the best person to do that well it might fall to the to the finance people to the accountants because they're good at putting that information together in a coherent way okay could i maybe just ask before we look at some of the other questions here and maybe mm. others in the realm of questions um so you you know the fr lab works extensively with organizations etc uh, and i'm wondering could you let us know phil what are the key or the most important things that these companies want to engage on because that obviously then has implications for us as higher mm. uh, delivering higher education yeah i mean i mean the number one theme at the moment is um is environmental social and governance reporting um esg reporting um there is you know and, and if i start with the with the investors um you know, when, when I started in the lab, I mean, this this just just points to how things have changed so much in the last in the last five years. When I when I started in the lab, many investment organisations would have um, part. You know, would, they would have some staff looking at um, ESG considerations, but they were very much sort of, you know, uh, often sort of peripheral to the main decision making in. In, in investment organizations so you know typically the, the the decision makers the portfolio managers would focus on financial aspects um, the ESG folks were there to to ensure that you know companies were thinking about it but it wasn't fully integrated into the investment management process um, and, and I think 
you know that has that has changed rapidly so you you now see the you know ESG considerations being very much integrated into the investment management process and if you look at the growth of ESG or sustainability related funds you know they they've grown very significantly and so so I think you know that has a knock on effect to to companies because investors need this data to be able to integrate it into their investment decision making you know, when we speak to investors, they very much want us to work with corporates to improve, you know, the, the ESG data that they're that they're giving to to investors. And so corporates are coming to us and saying, look, you know, can can you help us on on this? Um, you know, how can how can the lab in, in, engage on this? So, you know, our, our recent work is very much focused on ESG. When the, when the lab was first formed, which is actually we've just celebrated our ten year anniversary, it very much focused on financial statement. Uh, or financial disclosures. So we did projects around net debt and uh, CEO remuneration and and things like that, very sort of financial focused areas. If you look at more recent times, the focus has been very much more on ESG things. So we've done, uh, we did a project on climate change. We've did a, done, a, done a project on workforce reporting. So how companies can report on, on uh, various aspects of, of their workforce. Um, risk reporting which is very much looking at sort of broader aspects of uh you know how risk might impact on on companies so that that, that esg has very much been been the focus and then the and then the other aspect as as i said is is technology and how technology is impacting on on corporate reporting those are really much if if, if you look at our sort of current projects there's very much a focus on on those those two areas um and, so, and you, yeah, so so that's yeah, ESG is kind of the number one theme, and then mm -hmm. technology and how technology assists with all of that. So, Phil, yeah. just I mean, reflecting on what you're hearing from organisations, um, to what extent do you think the accountants that are going, the accounting students that are going into the, the profession from university, do you think there's a complete disconnect between what they're being taught at university and for example, ESG and technology. I'm trying to get a sense of, I suppose mm. people in the room will want a sense of, are we lagging behind or are we at the races as it were in terms of, you know, equipping our students to deal with these issues? Well, I, as I say, I think there's always a need for um, for the basics of accounting to, to be taught. You know, I'd hate a student to come out and not know double entry because, you know, I still use it. I still go back to it now, as I said, you know, when I was in in, in, in the enforcement team, you know, when you're looking at where things have gone wrong, you, you, you go back to the basics. You know, how were these transactions processed? What was the double entry at, at certain points and that sort of thing? So, you know, I think the, the basics will, will always need need to be there. I think the way the way I would look at it is is in terms of ESG the the sort of ESG should we teach ESG um, you know to to better prepare students I think the way I, I would look at it and and the way a lot of it actual investors are, um, are are wanting us to look at it as a regulator is is to say how are these broader topics like climate change um like you know culture and uh and workforce and and all of these things how are they impacting financial information so you know an, an investor will always you know the starting point for any investor is you know d doing a valuation model on a company and that valuation model will typically be a, a future you know, cash flow forecast, discounted future cash flow forecast to come up with a valuation of the company and decide, you know, whether it's worth investing in that in that company or not. But increasingly, you know, those those cash flow forecasts will be impacted by things like, you know, how much the company is investing in its workforce, um, how diverse the, com the, the you know the company is, how sustainable is it going to be, and therefore how is it going to be able to generate cash flow into the future. You know, in relation to climate change, where where companies are disclosing their um, uh, their transition strategy, you know, how is that going to impact on future cash flows for each part part of part of the business? And I think I would say thinking about it in in that way, you know, how can we teach accountants that these these sort of other ESG areas are going to impact on finance ultimately? How is it going to impact on businesses' cash flow go, going forward? 
and, and therefore creating a much better link between the ESG information and the financial information. I, I, I think personally that would be a good way of, of kind of incorporating it um, into, into, into your curriculums. Mm-hmm. Um, and do you, do you but, think that but, we're do you think we're behind in that there? What do you get a, a sense when you're talking to companies, Phil, if we're behind or where are we? That's difficult for me to to comment on so so much because I don't tend to see people directly out of university. We we tend to talk to the sort of I guess the C, CFO type type level. Um so it's it's difficult for me to for me to comment too, too much on that. I mean I think you know if i look at what audit firms are doing so i guess if if you know students are coming out um graduates are coming out and going into audit firms and getting their sort of initial training at at audit firms audit firms are increasingly incorporating esg considerations into into their training um so i think i think the more that you can prepare for uh prepare students for that you know you know the better prepared they'll, they'll be for that but it's you know, as I say, when I was when I was training, it was it was all about how do you verify the balance sheet. It was all about finance and, and less about that kind of broader understanding of how other factors um, might impact on on future cash flows and and, and okay. valuations of companies. Okay, so we've got a few other questions. Um, mm. Half us, half us. Do you want to talk to your question here? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Yes. Uh, which question? I'm sorry, because I, a very interesting talk, and uh, I just uh, posted a number Thank of you. questions. Mm. So, okay. Uh, to, my, my first question is, uh, to, to what extent international accounting standards and uh, international financial reporting standards uh, are in need for amendments to reflect impact of climate change risks in uh, financial reporting? And is it enough to have uh, disclosures in the annual reports and accounts of companies, or do we need a mechanism to reflect what's going on uh, in terms of uh, discount factors, uh, impact on impairment, impact on, uh, you may refer to uh, carbon taxes, carbon prices, etc. So there is a, a clear change, and what, what is required to be honest is, uh, is unknown yet. What do you think about this? Thank you. That's a wonderful question, um, and uh, and and it also gives me another prompt to talk about the Sustainability Standards Board, which has just been set up. Um, so I, I think there is increasing um, focus on 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 this uh, on, on this topic and and on the need for for companies to properly reflect climate change risk in their financial statements. And um, you may have seen, but the a couple of years ago. Uh, the IASB um, put out a briefing note, um, which was quite short, but but really, really helpful in setting out how climate change risk might impact on certain areas in, in the financial statements. And, you know, I, I think as a, I think that's a really good paper to, to use in an academic context, because it it's, you know, when you're teaching about impairment testing, and you're teaching about kind of as, useful asset lives and and things like that those are the, those are the things that where climate change risk might particularly impact on on the financial statements so you know impairment testing is all about as you know predicting cash flows for the next 20 years or or, or into into the future and, and discounting it so climate change impact will impact on the cash flows themselves it might inca- impact on the uh, the discount rate itself used to discount the cash flows back to to come up with your um, value, value in use or or whatever calculation you're using um, so I think there's there's some good guidance out there on how it impacts the financial statements but to your question I don't think it is enough to have climate change related risk disclosure purely in the financial statements because there may be businesses where climate change has a big impact on the business and the business decisions but not necessarily an impact on the financial statements you know if they if they don't have assets to impair they cut, they're not going to do any impairment testing, for example, or or so forth. And of course, you know, we always talk about climate related risks, but there's also climate related opportunities. You know, those businesses who who are investing in technology to reduce carbon emissions or, um, you, you know, who 
who are in sustainable um, energy production and things like that, where, where there's there's real opportunities, and you you don't always get an opportunity to to reflect that in the financial statements. So I think there is a need for information in what I call the front half of the annual report in the UK, the strategic report, to talk about you know how companies are responding to, to climate risk, um, as well as in, as well as thinking about how that might impact on the financial statements. And that leads me into talking about the the the, the, the formation of the International Sustainability Standards Board because the the problem that many companies have had over the last five years is you've got a you've got a massive amount of demand for ESG information, but no kind of standardisation of how you can you can you can produce that information. You know, there's all sort of all, all sorts of frameworks out there, integrated reporting framework, uh, SASB standards, all these sort of things, but companies get really frustrated because. Um, you might hear this later because, you know, investors are asking for different pieces of information which aren't always available to, you know, fr fr from the corporate. And, and so, you know, it's been universally welcomed, the setup of the International Sustainability Standards Board. Um, it's going to be a sort of sister organization of the ISB and it's going to produce international standards on sustainability, mm -hmm. which will give companies a framework in which to report um, sustainability information, including climate change, including diversity, including all these sort of different different areas, and that 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 sitting alongside, you know, companies really starting to properly think about impacts of of this on the financial statements, I think will will give a much better better system. I hope that answers your question, Hafiz. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for that. Hafiz, I noticed you had a, a follow up question. Has that been answered? Is is it enough to have climate change related risk disclosures in annual reports or should there be a neck mechanism that reflects the impact of climate change on financial reporting via discount rates impairment measures etc has that been answered now have us yes yes thank you okay thank you okay so graham graham mcdonald uh graham do you want to ask your question as well I'm just, I, hi, I'm just, uh, thank you, Philip, very, very interesting, but I'm just thinking uh, about Deloitte's being fined uh, for their 2016 audit of Mighty and their failure to audit um, goodwill impairments properly. It was climate risk, there's so much uncertainty. I'm just trying to figure out how an auditor um, could look at disclosures, could look at uh, cash flows from um, climate related provisions, given the amount of uncertainty um, and what the risks are for auditors um, of having regulators coming back in five or six years time with the benefit of hindsight, um, claiming that um, audits were, were negligent when that is not necessarily valid i think that's a, that, that that's a great question and an, an extremely difficult challenge for uh for, for, for accountants and uh, and auditors going going forward i think what we what we look at and um is is where there's i can't comment on individual enforcement cases and i don't think actually they were climate climate related but um you know what what we look for when we're reviewing an annual report is is consistency between the the front half and the, and the back half so for example if a if a if a company is saying in five years time this asset will no longer be you know we expect this asset to be wound down um because you know it's being replaced with a more sustainable asset or etc and then you look in the um in the accounts in the financial statements and you know at, at, a, at a very basic level you see cash flow forecasts out for for 20 years for that asset which they've said in the front half that they're, they're winding down now that's that's clearly a, a, a disconnect and something that you know auditors should should be should be picking up the inconsistency there is a recognition for for climate that there, there is a lot of a lot of uncertainty and i think that's why you know the, the frameworks that are being adopted the tcfd framework which is being going to be incorporated or has already been incorporated into the international sustainability standards focuses a lot on scenario analysis so looking at 
you know, what are the different scenarios and what, what are the impacts of those different scenarios on, on the company? Now, you know, auditors will, or companies will, in, in the first instance, will have to think very hard, you know, uh, it, what's the impact of the different scenarios on, on their financial statements and, you know, how, how does that impact on their, on the assumptions that they're, they're, they're taking. But I think if, if there's, if there's consistency across the front half and the back half, that, that's what we're looking for. We're not expecting companies to be able to, you know, predict the, the future with 100% certainty. What we want companies to do is lay out the different scenarios that, that, that they're facing and how they're likely to respond to, to those and not have those kind of blatant inconsistencies between the front half and the, and the back half where you're saying we're winding down something in the front half and then you've got cash flows going out for 20 years in the, in, in the impairment testing. But it's, you know, Graham, it's, 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 it's a challenge. It's a real challenge. So, you know, I understand. Okay, Graham, is that okay? Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. Excellent. I so just, we have a question, Darren. Saying, John, Darren? I was just going to interrupt slightly because Claudia had her hand up at that, at that comment. So would it be okay oh, if Claudia came back in? Sorry, yeah. John. I didn't see Hi, that. Thank so you. Obvious. Thank you. Uh, it was about uncertainty as well. I'm from another part of the world, but anyway, um, we are facing uh, uncertainty on a daily uh, basis. Mm. So I think this will increase in the future. So I was thinking, um, what do you think about us uh, finding the ways to prepare students in general and within business and accounting in particular in this case? Um, to deal with uncertainty and would it make sense for you, for example, us to get out of our traditional areas, uh, bringing different areas in, in terms of interdisciplinary approaches, apart from research, like you mentioned, um, studies relating to environmental and social uh, accounting, but not only going out, out of that area, because we have to, I think we will now, from now on, live within uncertainty. So that will have a huge impact um, in about everything we do in our daily lives, in our professions. And I think about that a lot. How to bring, um, how to help students to live in uncertain planes? Because for, the, for now, by now, they are very much used to structure. We provide the structure for them to learn, for them to do their understanding, interpretation, and we need, to, I think, to, to help students to um, educate them in a way that nothing is certain. That's the common ground. And from now, uh, what will you do? How will you interact with the world around you, with the, the entities you work with, with, with society? Because we, I think we will need to have a different approach to business, to, you know, I'm not sure if I was able to... <laughs> to express my ideas. Creativity is needed, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I think I, the starting point is to understand, you know, where are the, I mean, you can never, there's always been uncertainty and that's always impacted on, you know, accountants have always had to deal with kind of, you know, making assumptions on, on future prospects, um, making, making estimates in, in certain areas where, where, there's, where there's uncertainty. I think, you know the, the world that we live in now just has greater uncertainty and I, and i think you know climate change is, is is a real example of that where you know it, it is having a real impact on 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 the finances of, of companies on how investment decisions are, are, are being made for for example um you know the the, the changing working world that we're working in at the moment is is having impacts on you know you, you know how companies work how they remunerate people etc cetera, etc cetera. so that there's there's you know and and of course the the the, the situation in, in 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 Russia Ukraine at the moment is is creating you know a great great deal of uncertainty as well you, you know we actually in the lab we we put out guidance last uh, sorry when covid first uh first came to light course it's two years ago now isn't it um you know setting out what companies need to report in times of un uncertainty and a lot of that is is not is not kind of predicting with 100 percent certainty what the future looks like a, a lot of it is is saying this is how we deal with things in in times of un uncertainty you know this this is this is these are our risk management processes you know th this is how we we are thinking about 
flexing our business model in, in the event of, um, of, of a future event. So we actually just published something last week about supply chain issues that, that companies, companies are having you know, as a result of various sort of economic factors, inflation, you know, situation in, in Russia, Ukraine, and and, and so forth. Um, and it, it, it's about companies being able to respond to some some of these areas. I think we mentioned earlier, you know, cyber risk is, is increasingly a, a, a risk. And actually, when you look at how companies res- reported on on um, on cyber risk in the past, it was very much focused on how would they prevent a cyber attack. Going forward, it's actually more about how they respond to the inevitability of a, of a cyber attack. Can they, you know, ha- can they get their processes and systems controls in place quickly enough to be able to limit the damage of of, of something like that? And the same on climate change. You know, how, are their processes su- sufficiently? mature to be able to respond to to climate change impact going forward i think in terms of your your question around how can we prepare students i think the first thing is awareness of of all of these you know uncertainties um the, the second thing is thinking about different scenarios so in in the event that you know we do God forbid, go to a, a you know a two percent you know two degree impact. What you know what might be the impacts on that? What are the different scenarios that that we that we might have um, uh, in in place? And 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 actually, you know, a, a lot of a lot of those kind of scenarios are being developed by by regulators to help companies to think about those those different uh, different scenarios going forward. But I don't know whether that helps, Claudia. But it, it's it's a massive challenge. But yeah, you yeah, it helps because um, I think we should uh, bring to our classroom the topics you've mentioned more often, or, pre- mm. or perhaps to to because I think we would have to. I, I was not thinking in a particular um, theme or topic because we will. I think I sense we will have uh, since COVID, like you've mentioned, we entered in a uncertain mm, mm. area. And I, 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 you know, it, it will happen more often, different issues, different reasons, because of what we have done so far to the planet and the environment and lots of other things. So mm. it's good for us to be aware of that, to, to share that awareness and to try to, to make it kind of normal because we have to shift our structured ways to a more flexible way of, uh, mm. you know, adapting. So that was my thought. So it makes, um, thank you very much. You've uh, mentioned a lot of important themes to, to, I mean, to, yeah. to bring to discussion in the classroom, perhaps in a separate uh, subject matter, you know, crisis, how to deal with crisis for people to, to get, you know, comfortable yeah. with the thought and not get scared. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I think if I can do a sort of sales mm-hmm. pitch, um, I, I would very much highlight I would look at the lab reports um, because you know we did a report on COVID, so so that that was on not on COVID, but on how mm. companies are reporting on how they're responding to the challenges around around COVID. It contains lots of practical examples, so you could get students to kind of have a look at that. You know, ask them the question: What you know, it, it, in in a in a sudden event like that, where you know people are locked down, um, you know, supply chains are disrupted. You know, what do you think is going to be the impact on financial statements? What's going to be the impact on on the annual report? You know, maybe get get them thinking thinking through the the, the impacts, and and then obviously I would say get them to have a look at the lab reports because they they kind of contain those examples of how companies are responding to to these things. Um, you know, the, the publication we published last week on on supply chain risk was very much you know it's quite clear that supply chains have really been disrupted recently and um you know we need we felt we needed to put some guidance out to say this is what this is how companies should be thinking about it this is how they should be responding in their reporting okay okay thank you, thank you. is that okay Claudia? hopefully it is yes uh so we have a few more questions phil before we finish mm. uh so darren you wanted to ask to what extent do you think that internal and external reporting needs to be aligned to ensure that all stakeholder interests are covered. Yeah, thanks, John. Oh. Hi, Phil. Hi, Darren. Um, yeah, I, I 
I guess there's two aspects to my question. Really, the first is the sort of general uh, accounting climate question, and the, and mm. the second part would be to do with yeah. its link into uh, higher education. Um, and to a certain extent, I guess the integrated reporting agenda is is trying to do some of this, but it seems to me that a lot of corporate failures over uh, the last years have, have been really because of a mismatch between internal motivations and, and reporting as against um, external reporting needs and, and standards, um, and whether bringing those together would would protect more stakeholders particularly as we seem to now have, for instance, with the climate agenda, stakeholders who are not, who otherwise necessarily wouldn't have a direct association with a company. So we have people who are interested in the climate agenda who are sort of now stakeholders of companies that they weren't customers of, weren't particularly interested in, but are now interested in because of, of climate change. Um, and then I guess the second part of the question would be, in terms of higher education, financial reporting, auditing, and decision making and performance measurement, um, as, a, as a sort of management accounting discipline, have always been taught separately. Is it time that actually a lot of that should be brought together more? Yes, yes, and yes. I could not agree with you more. Um, I, I think it's a fantastic question, and it's something we're exploring at the moment um, in our the, the work we're doing on ESG data. Because, you know, some sometimes sometimes a company will have has got so many kind of things it's got to comply with um, in its reporting that companies can often start with, okay, what do I need to report? What you know, what what do the regulations say? I need to I need to report. And not think about how they can use that data for decision making making purposes. Um, and, and actually, you know, when you, when you hear some of the the companies that have adopted the the TCFD framework, when you hear some of them speak, they say actually we started off thinking we we this was a compliance exercise, and actually as we started to talk about it at board level we realized it's much, you know, it's going to be much more valuable for us to think about how the company can use that information for better decision making, you know, to decide what its strategy should be going forward. The TCFD framework has these sort of four pillars, you know, governance, strategy, risk, and metrics and targets. And metrics and targets is the last bit, because the first bit needs to be, okay, what's our strategy in response to climate risk? And how can we use the metrics and targets to measure the strategy it's not about you know what 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 the frc says we have to report or, or whatever that's not the starting point it should be you know what information do we need internally for for decision making decision making purposes because ultimately you know that's that's what investors are, are, are looking for is companies who can manage themselves effectively who can respond effect you know who have the data to be able to respond to to changing needs etc um so that, that, that's a I, I completely agree i think you know thinking about it more integrated than 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 sort of compliance is um actually i'll give you one other example in in a financial context um we did a project um a, a while ago actually on um artificial intelligence and we spoke to a company and it's it's in our report actually on artificial intelligence we spoke to uh, vodafone um who were implementing um ifrs 15 which was the which is the new um revenue stat or newish re revenue standard which had a big impact on them of course given the the, the nature of their contracts and, and so forth um, and one of the things they said it was they initially started off thinking about it as a as a you know how do we comply with IFRS 15 but actually you know as they started looking into it they realized actually some of the information that they were generating or some of the processes and controls that they were putting in place to comply with the standard actually could help them in their business you know help them determine customer behaviors in relation to contracts and things like and things like that and I thought that was that was really interesting because it was it was moving from a sort of compliant, you know, what have I got to do to comply with this standard to actually how is this how is this going to help me with internal um, decision making? That's okay. Great. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Phil. Phil, Lisa would like to ask you a question. Lisa, do you want to maybe talk to your question? Uh oh. 
Hi. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. <laughs> but um, no, this is this is a nice question, and I think um, I think we've probably touched on uh, a lot of it already. But one of the things I think we're all really interested in is is aside from the technical about the the, the skills and the competencies side of things. And and I know in your your work you don't directly um, interact with with graduates, if you like. But I guess from speaking a lot with with companies and and that kind of engagement, you've probably got a feel for the kind of skills that that accountants and and finance professionals are perhaps increasingly um, needing and so it'd be interesting just to, to get your views on is there a, a changing landscape in terms of, of skills and that might be something interesting for us to take away and think about how we can embed those skills um, within our curriculum yeah i, I mean i th i think as, as i say um it it it's moving from the sort of focus on the production of you know a, a set of financial statements more towards being able to um to provide much more sort of interpretive uh type information so you know what 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 do i what do i mean by by that obviously it's really important that you understand how to pull together a, a set of accounts um but but i think you know what what finance folks are, are, are really you know, being asked to do is to say, behind that number is is so many different, you know, so many different things impact on a, on a particular number. So if you take a, a fixed asset, you, you know, what what impacts on that? You know, we we know how to pull it together. It's you know, you buy an asset and you you value it and you depreciate it, right? Um, and that go, goes through the balance sheet and P and L accordingly. Um, but actually, behind that, it's well, we've made an estimate of how long that asset is going to is going to is going to last now that estimate is based on a variety of different factors and increasingly a variety of different different factors can i can i as a as a student talk through how that company might have considered you know the factors that 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 have valued that that asset or or or, or determined it as its its useful life well it could be you know impacted by a whole whole range of of different things you know where is that asset is it is it in an area that's uh, affected by social political events is it is it an is it an asset that might be affected by flood damage or or climate change you know and getting that kind of I, I think sort of broadening out that understanding was you know here are the numbers and here's here's how we've sort of put it in a in a balance sheet and p l but actually to be able to talk through the decisions the assumptions the, the you know that, that have been made around those um around those balances um you know i, I think that's where the where where the skills need to need need to develop yeah, and really, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Is that okay, um, Lisa? Yeah, th thank you. It's really interesting. I, I think I think one of the conversations that uh, that I know that we're having, and I, I guess a lot of other institutions, is about how we need to maybe take the technical nature of what we're teaching and give it this broader context. Yeah. So ex exactly that example you gave of an asset and like where is it and how do we use it and how does it link to our business model it is I think really important and should make the, the teaching more interesting surely for, for the students rather than just saying mm. this is how you calculate depreciation get the number right it's much more interesting to think about well, what impacts on that number so I think it's good for students but good for us as well as teachers so yeah, yeah. thank you yeah yeah I mean, one one of the things our, I know our corporate reporting review team always do is they they start off by reading the kind of disclosures around how the companies articulate their business model, and then they look at the accounts and see if there's a connect, you know, in the segmental reporting or the, you know, or or asset useful asset lives or or whatever it is. It, it's kind of it's quite interesting, you know. Some companies are good at it. Some companies there's a bit of a disconnect, you know, and and they'll, they'll be picked up on that. And I think. You know, rather than thinking of climate change or, or workforce reporting as a kind of separate exercise, it's kind of you know making making those links. Yeah, I think that will that will prepare people for for, for the discussions you know okay. go, going forward. And Sarah, you have a, a related question. Do you want was that why your hand was up? Perhaps it, it was. It was just a. It was more of a. I suppose an observation in in terms of. I think mm -hmm. we've got quite a lot of expectations management to do with our students because mm -hmm. often the students come in mm -hmm. and they say. 
you know, they understand that they have to learn the basics, but they say, well, why don't you provide us a template? Because we're going to have a template when we get out into the working world. But, and they don't get that, uh, the fact that they really do need to know the basics, which is great to hear uh, uh, Phil mm. saying that, you know, I go back to my double entry. And I think <laughs> part of what we've got to do in the teaching side is, is put, as you say, put that context around it for them. But we, they have to learn the basics first you know they really do and and absolutely and i think that's a challenge i think we're all facing is that the students are coming in with an expectation that actually they don't need to do the basics because the basics are taken care of by a computer system or whatever mm. and and so i think there's quite a bit of education mm. that we need to, to to do so that we don't get that gap yeah, I mean, they might be right in that they don't need to do the basics, but they definitely need to understand the basics. And to understand anything, you need to know how to do it. We have a number of other hands up, but we're running out of time. Oh, if no. Everyone wants to get the coffee. <laughs> so I wonder, Darren and Paul, would your questions keep until the, we come back from the breakout rooms? Yeah, Darren? Yeah, yeah of course. Thank you. Sorry, I just want to keep on time because it's tiring and people do need some breaks. Um, just to let you know that uh, half us, thank you. You've got a link up to the IFRS standards and climate related disclosures. Uh, also say thank you. You've got a link up to where we, we uh, upload all of our videos of all of our guest speakers. Um, the Just one other thing. Yes, um, Lisa, you've said that you use the FR lab resources in your teaching and the students really like them and they spark quite a lot of debate in the classroom. So maybe that's something could we maybe put in a link here to those resources so that people have that. And then really just the final, that. yes, brilliant. And really just the final thing, um, Dawn, you had a question. You asked, what are the views of corporates who engage with the lab uh, on the future of integrated reporting? Do you want to say something more about that, Don? just quickly as our last question before we break for coffee? Um, I think I think that probably um, says it all really. So for the um, investors and uh, corporates that engage with the lab, do they have a view on the future of integrated reporting? If people did that, would that uh, meet their needs or is it too fixed and rigid, even though in theory it's not? Um, and so there's a bigger ESG space that couldn't be filled by integrated reporting. So the Integrated Reporting Council was was merged with, uh, initially merged with SASB, um, which is a, a US-based uh, sort of sustainability reporting framework to form the Value Foundation, uh, Value Reporting Foundation. And that now is all merging into the International Sustainability Standards Board. So I think companies that hold, so I would expect that all of those frameworks will be kind of merged together in the development of, of international standards on sustainability. And so that companies already starting to do integrated reporting or who have started to do integrated reporting will probably have a, have a bit of a head start, you know, when, when the standards do, do get, do get developed. Um, I always think of there's kind of, it, integrated reporting with a capital I and a capital R, which is the integrated reporting framework. Um, integrated reporting with a small I and a small R, it is really what we've been trying to do, you know, in, in the UK with the strategic report for, for a long time, i.e., you know, have not, not have an annual report which has a front half and a back half which don't talk to each other, ha have an integrated report where you can clearly see the, the links between the, the, the information in the front half of an annual report and the back half. So, you know, very, very supportive of, of an integrated uh, report. And I think using the integrated reporting framework will, will be a good head start for when we do have consistent international sustainability standards. Okay, thank you. Hopefully Dawn has answered your question. Excellent. So we'll break now for coffee. When you come back at, we'll say at three or four minutes past 11, we'll automatically be, you'll automatically be in your breakout rooms. I think that's how we're going to do it, say. Uh, and we'll talk in the breakout rooms with about 15 or 20 minutes. And if you just think about what you've heard today from Phil and the discussion and think about what are the implications for us as accounting educators. OK, so have a think about that. And maybe if each group, when you come back, could you maybe just give a very, very brief uh, feedback on, you know, what you've discussed in those rooms. And then we'll go on to the second talk. So we'll see you all then in the breakout rooms about three or four minutes past 11. 
thank you so much uh, for listening. Thank I really you. appreciate oh, sorry, it. Well, thank I, you, Joan. Well, I forgot to say, uh, sorry, I forgot to say thank you so much. No, no, no. In my No, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Really enjoyed and, and, your discussion. It was brilliant. It's great to get the FRC's view. Uh, and we're, we were delighted that you were able to accept our invitation, Phil. And hopefully we can call on you again as things progress in, in these areas that you're talking about, Phil, because it's great for us to have links with the your, your organizations such as yours who are at the kind of the core face, as it were. Absolutely. Thank you very yeah. much for, for giving me Thanks, the opportunity. Phil. Okay. I'm just I'm... putting the link in the chat so that you've got it before. Brilliant. Uh, Thank you very much. Right. We'll see everybody we then. Thank you Thanks, so much. Ben.